morning. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, Jesus loves me, this I Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gates to open wide, he will wipe away my tears, let me home to heaven again, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you have given us your love, you came to the earth and died, suffered and died at the hands of men, tortured and abused, that you could give us salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love us. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Help us to take that glorious gospel message to a lost and dying, hurting, hungry world. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Um, but Sister Moji is going to hand out some notepads and some pens uh, for you to take some notes. Now, there's going to be some information that you might want to take notes on in, in the, in the uh, beginning, the introduction, but it's more important even for a little bit later. Um, so you, you just do what you want to do on the first part, but I really would like for you to take some notes on the second part as we, as we come through there. Last time I was up here, one of the issues we talked about was abortion. One of the rationales pro-abortion people use for promoting abortion is they claim that the world is becoming overpopulated. They tell people all over the world that this earth is going to run out of space, so we, we need to abort unwanted babies. So we will continue to have room. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let me ask you, if we wanted to gather everyone in the whole world together for a standing room only Sinash concert, how big of a space would we need? A standing room only concert for every person in the whole world. How much would, uh, space would we need? Well, let's see. There's almost 7.8 billion people in the world. If we gave each person four square feet to stand in, that's two feet by two feet, so two feet wide and two feet in front of you, there would be enough person enough room for pretty much everybody to stand uh, um, but in a, in a two by two, by two uh, square. And there might be a few people that are a little bigger than that, but there's a lot of people that are a lot smaller than that. So if we averaged out to four square feet uh, standing in, we would need 31.2 billion square feet. Okay, so how big is a mile? A mile is 5,280 feet long. A square mile is 5,280 times 5,280. That's 27,878,400 square feet in a square mile. So now if we divide 31.2 billion by the 
amount of square feet in a square mile, 27,878,000 approximately, we get 1,119.15 square miles. Well, guess how many square miles are in Snohomish County, right here where we live? It's 2,196. It should be coming up there on the screen. There we go. It's two, in the middle, you see uh, Snohomish County. You, if, you, if you look over here, you can see Everett, okay? And Snohomish County comes, the, there's a black line right there. So Seattle's down here. Bellingham would be up, way up there. That's Snohomish County, 2,196 square miles. So we would need just over half of our county for that concert. Uh, Thomason, can you get us started on that, start arranging that concert for everybody in the whole world? Where did she go? I need, I need her to help me set up that concert. Um, so we would need a little over half of just our county to stand everybody in the whole world for a concert. But you might tell me we couldn't live in four square feet, and you might be right. So if we divided the whole world into four people in each family, and we gave each family a 50 by 100 foot lot, that's kind of a, a, a normal, maybe even a little bit bigger than a normal average suburban lot for a home. And then we give the, uh, each one a home on a, on a 50 by 100 foot lot to live. How big of space would we need? We could fit everyone, every one of those almost 2 billion families into the two states of Texas and Oklahoma. So that should be, here's Texas and Oklahoma is just to, nor to the north there. So these two states here, we could give everybody in the whole world a 50 by 100 foot lot, and the whole world would fit in those two states. Remember we were talking about, is this earth overpopulated? So therefore we need abortion. If we gave each of those families a whole acre, still four people in each family, we gave each one of those people a whole acre so they could grow their own food. We'd fit them all in Australia. But let's say you're one of those people that just love wide open spaces and plenty of room. If we gave every person in the whole world their own acre, you get your own acre, you get your own acre, you get your own acre. If we had four people in a family, we'd have four whole acres. If we gave everybody in the whole world their own acre, we would need the continent of Africa and the countries of France and most of Spain. So here's Africa. Now look at the rest, South America, United States, Alaska, Canada, uh, Russia, China, uh, uh, England up here somewhere, uh, Scandinavia, everything. Here's Africa, and there's France, and most of Spain, and we would fit all 7.8 billion people in this world, all with one acre for each person. Jumoke and I love to travel. Many times while driving down the highway, we comment to each other uh, how we are traveling mile after mile through habitable area and without seeing hardly any homes. We fly over miles and miles of habitable area seeing wide open land. And I've heard that if you fly over China, one of the most densely populated areas of the world, that's China on your screen, you see the same thing, miles and miles of rice paddies and other vegetation. So it seems that we really don't have a problem with space. There's a bent 
where those people want to promote abortion, so they want to tell you, they want people to believe, we're going to run out of space, so we got to cut down on having babies and, and uh, abort uh, babies and stuff. But some people might say, okay, there's enough land to support more and more and more people, but there's not enough food. There are people starving to death all over the world. And I would say that there are a lot of reasons why people starve to death, including politics. Governments control the food supply and indeed allowing it to rot in the harbor rather than let their own people have it. This is actual, actually a reality. And religion, people worshiping their cows and making sure that the cows are well taken care of, but not even thinking about eating those cows. But they lack the ability to produce food the, but the lack of ability to produce food is not one of the problems. Let me give you one little example. Farming can be a risky business. One year a farmer could have a bumper crop and another year he could have famine or floods. A bumper crop could mean that there's too much pr produce which causes the price per bushel to go down. Thus he's getting less money per bushel for his crop. If there's less crop coming in for all the farmers, then they get paid a higher price per bushel, but they may have much lower numbers of bushels. So it's a difficult thing to keep that balance correctly. Because of this situation, the U.S. government supports the farmers with programs that help even out their income. Our government actually spends some money for farmers to not grow food each year. Last year, I can't remember if it was actually last year or if it was the year before, but I actually looked it up. Um, last year, I think it was $14 billion U.S. government paid farmers to not grow food. Now, grains are good nutrition. And I took the average of price per bushel for corn, price per bushel for soybeans, and for wheat. And if you average them all out, like corn is low. It's in the $3 a bushel range. Uh, I think the soybeans was up uh, almost to $10 per bushel. And then wheat was in between. So when I took the average, it comes to around $6 per bushel. People that know this stuff, study this stuff, say it takes about 92 bushels of grains to feed one person uh, a balanced diet for one year. So if instead of paying farmers to not grow food, we gave them the money for the food and distributed the food to those areas where people are starving, let's see what we could do. If we divided the 14 billion uh, we paid farmers to not grow food by the average price per bushel of $6, we would get 2.3 billion bushels of mixed grains. If we divide the 2.3 billion bushels by 92 bushels it takes to feed one person for a year, a good balanced diet, we'd be able to feed 25 million people for one year. Guess how many people died of starvation around the world last year? 91, I mean 9.1 million people and we could feed on just what we pay farmers to not grow food, we could pay uh, for enough people to eat for a year, 25 million. And it was only 9.1. I, mean, I don't want to minimize it, but I'm just comparing here. 9.1 million people starved to death around the world last year. Now that seems like a real possible and simple solution. It's actually not that simple. The American government has sent shiploads of food to destitute areas only to have their dictator communist government hold the food in the harbor until it's spoiled rather than accept help from capitalist America. So the answers are not real simple. There's a lot of political and religious and different reasons why people starve to death I've just been trying to point out that the world is not in danger of overpopulation. But there is a region that is definitely overpopulated. There is population explosion in hell. 
and we have the technology to stop it. Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell. Matthew chapters 5 and 18 talk about the desperate measures we should be willing to take to make sure we do not wind up in hell. So what is that technology that we have to stop the flood of people on their way to hell? I sang on my knees before starting the sermon this morning, Jesus loves me. This I know. Because this is the simple message of the gospel that Jesus wants us to take to the whole world and prevent people from suffering and dying in hell. James 5.20 says, He who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Timothy 4, says, 7, Exercise yourselves toward godliness. William Evans, in his book, Personal Soul Winning, says every Christian should consider it his highest honor and the greatest privilege to assist the growth of the kingdom of God by personal soul winning, personal effort in individual soul winning. Personal... I tried to get one of these finger uh, things, and it's not... My, my pages are sticking together. Personal soul winning is that art of reaching people with the gospel. There are four basic qualifications to be soul winners. First, we must have a relationship with the divine. We need to be born from above. We have had a physical birth. We need a spiritual birth. We call it being born again. We need to be filled with the spirit. But being filled with the spirit years ago isn't enough. We need to be alive spiritually, keeping fresh. We need the Spirit continually running in us and through us. And we must be people of prayer, keeping connected with heaven and staying on fire for God. We must have a desire to see souls saved, realize the urgency, have a deep sense of responsibility. Ezekiel 33, 8-9 God says, when I'm saying to the wicked, you shall surely die, he says, he's talking to us as believers. He says, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from their way, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your own soul. It may not be the responsibility of Christians to bring every individual to Christ, but it is their responsibility to see that Christ is brought to every individual. Not every man will want Christ, but as I sang this morning, Jesus loves me and he loves everybody. Not every man will want Christ, but Christ wants every man woman, boy, and girl. And it is the business of God's people to let every man know that Christ wants him. We must also have a confidence in the power of the word of God. His word shall not return unto him void. And with that, a faith that never despairs. Beyond the basic qualifications, there are three things we need to develop. Uh, this, is a, this is the section where I was saying it'd be good for you to take notes. Because we are supposed to be soul winners, every one of us. This is not the pastor's job. This is every one of us that are supposed to be involved with this. So if there's some points that can help you be more confident and more comfortable in talking to somebody that maybe you never talked to before, it might be a good idea to say, take notes so you can review it again. Beyond the basic qualifications, there are three things we need to develop 
to reach the lost, and they spell out the acronym ACT. Remember 1 Timothy 4, 7, exercise yourself toward godliness. Years ago, we had a friend, Karen, a few doors down, and she wanted to teach a Bible class, but she was not confident in speaking in front of groups. She would have stage fright just getting up to talk in front of groups. But she knew that as a Christian, she needed to touch people for Jesus, so she had to get past that comfort zone problem. She decided to sell toys through a party company where she would set up home parties with a host who would invite friends to come. She would demonstrate the toys, people would order, the host would get gifts, and she would make money. She did this not because she needed money, but just to break down her fear and build her self-confidence so that she could effectively teach the Bible class. We're talking about exercising ourselves unto godliness. I've mentioned this to you before, but when I was young, I was shy. I would prefer when around a crowd to just stay off on the side, maybe read a book or just talk with a friend. But I realized that as a Christian who is supposed to touch people for Jesus, I needed to break out of my shyness so I could communicate with people. So I started working on stretching myself, getting out of my comfort zone. We're talking about exercising ourselves toward godliness. So those three things we need to develop to help reach the lost spell out the acronym ACT. Ability, contact, and tact. Ability, the characteristic of the life of Jesus, our great example. Ability is defined as the power of bringing things to pass. We need the ability to read and understand men, understand the ways and reasonings of men. We can develop this through many avenues, reading, doing something to stretch yourself, like we were just talking about, interacting with people, maybe at the grocery store or at work or in the marketplace of life. Every day we should be practicing these kind of things so that we can get better and better at touching people for Jesus, putting ourselves out there. We need ability in handling the Bible. We've talked a lot about this in Sunday school recently, memorizing scripture and meditating on it, mulling it over, internalizing it, making it a part of who we are. We need ability to bring about decisions. Asking for the sale. I've been in sales for many years, and in sales, many sales are lost because a salesman is hesitant to ask for the sale. You can do the most wonderful presentation in the world, get the person all excited, but many times a, 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 con, a customer needs you to actually ask them for the sale or they may walk out the door actually wanting the product that you have, but not biting the bullet and doing it if you don't ask for the sale. Now, we'll deal with, uh, with this uh, more in a little bit. So the next one, so it's... Um, yeah, ability and then contact. Contact is defined as the coming together of two bodies in space, coming into touch with your man. How long has it been since you stopped to help somebody, somebody that you didn't know? How long has it been since you were a personal emissary or ambassador for the kingdom of God? Two things to remember regarding contact. Christians must have contact with God, and they must have contact with men. There's two types of contact. Casual, the opportunity arises and you take the opportunity, or planned, planned visitation or personal work. There's two different approaches. There's the direct approach. In the church I grew up in, the, past, uh, the pastor's uncle got saved in his mid-50s. And he had just been a drunk for many years. His life was radically transformed, and he was so excited you couldn't keep him quiet if you wanted to. Brother Cayman was a wonderful, precious, precious man, and we all loved him. And if you went out into the community, he was known by some as the Apostle of Finkel Road in Detroit, Michigan. And he did win some people to the Lord. 
Unfortunately, it seems that he would win them and them then drive them away because they thought it was also his responsibility to be the Holy Spirit to them and straighten them out. He wound up with a negative reputation. In fact, I was just talking to my brother the other day about Brother Cayman because he, he had been in the community and heard feedback from some of the community. He said he actually went down Finkel one time because he was wondering how this guy was having effect because he would, he would walk several miles from his house over to our house and, and uh, bang on our door and uh, wake us up on Saturday morning early and then he'd walk all the way back all that way and on this way, he's going into stores and businesses and places and putting out tracts and witnessing to people. And that's good. But again, we're talking about the direct approach. The direct approach sometimes is too strong because my brother said he went out into the community and he went in and just mentioned this guy. Neutral. Just ask, hey... Is there a guy that comes in here sometimes? And he was kind of unique. He wasn't that hard to identify. So does he come? And he wound up with several business owners cussing, screaming and yelling because they hate this guy that comes in and barrages them. And what one of them said, he, he puts little boxes of pamphlets out and he said, I take them when I find them and I throw them away. And he comes in and he finds another hiding place to put them again. Well, that's a direct approach. I'm not saying if the Holy Spirit tells you to use a direct approach that you shouldn't do it. But let's look at the indirect approach. The indirect approach helps by removing two major barriers. Fear on the part of the soul winner. Let's face it, we're all humans and we're not all preachers. And uh, we're not all that forward to just love to go out and, and approach people. So the indirect approach helps by removing the fear on the part of the soul winner. Sometimes we can be self-conscious and it keeps us from sharing Jesus with people because we're so self-conscious. And it helps with removing fear on the part of the person that we're talking to. You know, people don't always like their comfort zone uh, spoiled and their little place of solitude interrupted. So it actually helps the, the person that we're trying to reach. Examples of the indirect approach. Commenting on an accident when talking with someone. You, maybe you saw an accident happen. Maybe you happen to be one of the ones that's standing there. and uh, Maybe it's an accident in your neighborhood or maybe it's tra traffic is blocked because there was a bad accident on the highway or something and you happen to be in a position where you're talking to people nearby and, you're, and, and an indirect pro uh, approach to bring up the subject, to help people to think about eternity. I wonder, well, I hope they were ready to meet their maker. An indirect approach. Or speaking of something or anything powerful or majestic. And I asked the brother to come up and give me a, a thunderstorm <clears throat> with the drums. Brother, can, can we get a thunderstorm? A big loud storm. Yeah. See, I told you the other day I love the drums. So I found an excuse to get, the, get him to play drums for him. But I was thinking about powerful, majestic storms and mountains and waves crashing on the ocean shore. These all speak to me of the might and the power of God. Indirect approach. We can say, wow, that always makes me think of God. I might be out at the beach and the ocean. You go all the way out to ocean shores and you want to see the ocean where... Uh, if you could see that far, you see Japan on the other side or uh, Korea on the other side because that's the Pacific Ocean and you see waves crashing on the shore and maybe somebody else is out at the beach and you can take, you can just walk along and have your little peaceful walk if you want to, but you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Can't you just say to the person, wow, these waves crashing make me think of the power and majesty of God. The indirect approach. Sometimes those kind of comments can help bring a conversation. And remember the scriptures tell us some plant, others water, and others might harvest what was planted. 
But we should be doing one of those all the time. We might not be the one that prays with that person on the beach, but the person we saw on the beach, you might get them to start thinking. Maybe they go home at night and they remember another story or another encounter or something. Maybe they went to school, but they, they left God many, many years ago. But now you got them thinking. They're thinking, wow, that's right. I don't, I don't have a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit can use that and dig in and reach to people. Anything we can to gently open the door. Meeting people. Don't be afraid to meet people in different situations. Jesus was a friend of publicans and sinners, and he even ate with sinners. And then, so ability and contact and tact is the third one. The skill and readiness in dealing with people. And the mental ability of doing and saying the right thing at the right time so as not to unjustly offend or anger. The open eye, the quick ear, the judging taste, the keen smell, the lively touch. Always be on the lookout for an opportunity. How can I get Jesus into this conversation? We should be thinking this thought many times every day. How can I get Jesus into this conversation? Jesus used tact. Men brought a woman taken in adultery to Jesus. He took his time. He got their attention. Stooping down, I often wondered, what in the world was he writing on the ground? There's been people that have conjectured and tried to act like they know, but none of us actually know because the scriptures don't tell us what it says. But he stooped down and wrote something, and whatever it was, they were watching because they were waiting for an answer. This woman was taken in adultery. Isn't it funny how they took the woman in adultery? If we saw her in the act, then they also saw the man, right? How come they didn't bring the man for judgment? How come the guy gets off scot-free? Just a question. Uh, but Jesus got their attention, stooping down and writing on the ground. Then he said... He that is without sin, oh, this harsh, harsh, judgmental, mean Jesus. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. A few moments later, later he spoke to the woman. He said, where are they that accuse you? And she said, there's no man, Lord. Because Jesus used tact to get these people to realize, I don't have a right. I've done things myself using tact. Then with the woman at the well, Jesus treated her gently. You know, he led people. Rather than badger them, he asked for a drink to start the conversation. I mean, he could have come to her. She's by herself. He could have said, Did you, are you looking for the Messiah? Hey, I'm the Messiah. Are you looking for the Messiah? You need to get right with God. You know, you Samaritans, you're all messed up. You're all messed up politically. You're all messed up spiritually. You don't even worship in the right place. Why don't you get yourself straightened out spiritually? You should be running after, you know, I'm the one. He started out by saying, can I have a drink? Because he could start a conversation with something that didn't have seemingly anything to do with spiritual life, except he used tact. And he transferred it right in. He said, if you knew who it was that was asking you, he said, you would ask me for a drink because I can give you living water. Now he had the lady's attention because she came to the well all the time to get water. And at first she's not totally understanding. So she's like, if I had living water, if I had what he's talking about, I wouldn't have to come here all the time. But he used those questions, those statements to open the conversation. Then he asked her, bring your husband. And Jesus, because he knows all men, and he knew. She said, I don't have a husband. Now we're getting down where she lives. Jesus was exposing that, and then she said, then Jesus said, you've said the truth. You actually had five husbands, and you're living with somebody else right now. And then she went into the town, 
and told them, come see a man that told me any, everything I ever did. And now they had a camp meeting service out there by the well. People were coming to Jesus. Now some of them didn't come right away, and some of them refused. But some came to know Jesus, because Jesus used tact to lead her into a conversation. There's a song I heard many years ago by John Fisher. I just found it. Uh, I, I always wondered. I only heard it one time, and, and I loved it. I've even mentioned it in sermons before. But I just found it when I Googled it. It says, I'm not one who's got it all in place, telling you what you should do. No, I'm just one old hungry beggar showing you where I found food. This is an example of indirect approach where you can start wetting somebody's appetite, start making them hungry for spiritual things. You're not acting like you have it all together, but I'm just an old hungry beggar, but I did find food, and I'm trying to tell you where you can find some. A verse of that song says, Maybe you aren't hungry and maybe you don't thirst at all, but maybe the years have hardened the tears and you really are a beggar after all. I'm not one who's got it all in place telling you what you should do. No, I'm just one old hungry beggar showing you where I found food. Psalm 38, 34, verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Use, develop your own for your own personality, but use these kind of things. Describe your relationship with Jesus as tasting. You know how you seem to just be loving your steak, friend that I'm having lunch with? You're loving your steak or loving your hamburger or loving your pizza or whatever. You know how you're loving that? That's how I feel spiritually about my relationship with Jesus. Tact, indirect ways to open up a conversation and start somebody interacting you with you and finding out about this real, alive relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Use words and songs and memorize scripture. Another song that I love, Because of Calvary, says, I lived a wasted life that had no meaning. I found no peace in anything I tried, but I saw my life quickly end and a brand new one begin the day I found the cross where Jesus died. And because of Calvary, I'll never be the same again. I found the joy I never thought could ever be. He took a life shattered with sin, put it together once again. And oh, what a change there's been because of Calvary. Another verse, when my heart is sad and growing weary, I journey in my mind back to Calvary and I kneel beneath its flow that washes white as snow, and I find new strength awaiting there for me. It's because of Calvary I'll never be the same again. I found the joy I never thought could ever be. He took a life shattered with sin, put it together once again, and oh, what a change there's been because of Calvary. Hymns, old songs are so easy to help you to start to minister to individuals because these songs relate directly to us and then we can start quoting the words with passion and helping the person to see there's something beyond this mundane, drab, boring uh, mess of a life that they believe they've gotten themselves in. An old hymn, All My Life Long I Had Panted, for a draught from some cool spring that I hoped would quench the burning of the thirst I felt within. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood. I now am saved. Well of water ever springing, bread of life so rich and free, untold wealth that never faileth, my Redeemer is to me. Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long has craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood. I now am saved. I want us to jot down three rules for personal work. Number one, don't preach. Be conversational. Use words, phrases, and examples that people can relate to. I've trained many salespeople in my career, and I always teach them that one of the most important things for you to do is be yourself. You don't have to put on anything fancy or exaggerated or anything. Just be yourself. Be relaxed 
and have fun. And this includes with, uh, witnessing too. Be relaxed and have fun. Be a real person with the people you're in contact with. You know, Jesus was actually fun. I can picture Jesus at the, the marriage uh, that he cr turned water into wine. I can picture him even maybe getting some of the preteens and teenagers and running out uh, in, uh, in the outside area and, and playing tag or something like that. I believe Jesus was probably one of the most fun people. Then uh, don't preach. Refrain from acting like you know it all. There's no better way to drive people away than acting like you know it all. But do, do be authoritative. Speak with confidence about the word of God and speak with confidence about your own experience. I want to read you a parable, the parable of the orange tree by John White. He said, I dreamed I drove on a Florida road, still and straight and empty. On either side were groves of orange trees, so that as I turned to look at them from time to time, line after line of streets stretched back endlessly from the road, their boughs heavy with round orange fruit. This was harvest time. My wonder grew as the miles slipped by, how could the harvest be gathered? Suddenly I realized that for all the hours I had driven, and this was how I knew I must be dreaming, I had seen no other person. The groves were empty of people. No, no other car had passed me. No houses were to be seen beside the highway. I was alone in a forest of orange trees. But at last I saw some orange pickers. Remember, this is a parable. Try to relate. The oranges are the lost souls that need to be saved. I was alone in a forest of orange trees, but at last I saw some orange pickers. Far from the highway, almost on the horizon, lost in the vast wilderness of unpicked fruit, I could discern a tiny group of them working steadily. And many miles later, I saw another group. I could not be sure, but I suspected that the earth beneath me was shaking with silent laughter at the hopelessness of their task, reaching all the oranges. Yet the pickers went on picking. The sun had long passed its zenith and the shadows were lengthening when without any warning I turned a corner of the road to see a notice leaving neglected county entering home county. The contrast was so startling that I scarcely had time to take in the notice. I had to slow down for all at once the traffic was heavy. People by the thousands swarmed the road and crowded the sidewalks. Even more startling was the transformation in the orange groves. Orange groves were still there, and orange trees in abundance. But now, far from being silent and empty, they were filled with the laughter and singing of multitudes of people. Indeed, it was the people we noticed rather than the trees, people, and houses. I parked the car at the roadside, and I mingled with the crowd. Smart gowns, neat shoes. This was Sunday, see? Neat shoes, showy hats, expensive suits, and starched shirts made me a little conscious of my work clothes. Everyone seemed so fresh and poised and cheerful. I is it a holiday? I asked a well-dressed woman with whom I fell in step. She looked a little startled for a moment, and then her face relaxed with a smile of gracious condescension. Uh, you're a stranger around here, aren't you? She said. Before I could reply, she said, this is Orange Day. She must have seen a puzzled look on my face, for she went on, it is so good to turn aside from one's labors and pick oranges one day of the week. But don't you pick oranges every day, I asked her? Well, one may pick oranges at any time, she said. We should always be ready to pick oranges, but Orange Day is the day we devote especially to orange picking. I left her and made my way further into the trees. Most of the people were carrying a book bound beautifully in leather and edged and lettered in gold. I was able to discern on the edge of one of them the words, Orange Picker's Manual. By and by, I noticed around one of the orange tree, uh, trees there were seats that had been arranged, rising upward in tiers from the ground. The seats were almost full. But as I approached the group, a smiling, well-dressed gentleman shook my hand and conducted me to a seat. 
There, around the foot of the orange tree, I could see a number of people. One of them was addressing all the people on the seats, and just as I got to my seat, everyone rose to his feet and began to sing. The man next to me shared with me his songbook. It was called Songs of the Orange Groves. They sang for some time, and the song leader waved his arms with a strange and frenzied abandon, exhorting the people in intervals between the songs to sing more loudly. I grew steadily more puzzled. When do we start to pick oranges, I asked the man who loaned me his book. It's not long, he, uh, long now, he told me. We like to get everyone warmed up first. Besides, we want to make the oranges feel at home. I thought he was joking, but his face was serious. After a while, a rather fat man took over from the song leader, and after reading two sentences from his well-thumbed copy of the Orange Picker's Manual, he began to make a speech. I wasn't clear whether he was addressing the people or the oranges. I glanced beyond me and saw a number of groups of people similar to our own gr uh, group gathering around an occasional tree and being addressed by other fat men. Some of, the tree some of the trees had no one around them. Which trees do we pick from, I asked the man beside me. He did not seem to understand, so I pointed to the trees round about. Uh, this is our tree, he said, pointing to the one we were gathered around. But there are too many of us to pick from just one tree, I protested. Why, there are more people than oranges. But we don't pick oranges, the man explained. We haven't been called. That's the head orange picker's job, the pastor's job. We're here to support him. Besides, we haven't been to college. You need to know how an orange thinks before you can pick it successfully. Orange psychology, you know. Most of these folk here, he went on pointing to the congregation, have never been to manual school. Manual school, I whispered. What's that? It's where they go to study the orange picker's manual, my informant went on. It's very hard to understand. You need years of study before it makes sense. I see, I murmured. I had no idea that picking oranges was so difficult. The fat man at the front was still making his speech. His face was red, and he appeared to be indignant about something. So far as I could see, there was rivalry with some of the other orange-picking groups. But a moment later, a glow came on his face. But we are not forsaken, he said. We have much to be thankful for. Last week, we saw three oranges brought into our baskets, and we are now completely debt-free from the money we owed on the new cushion covers that grace the seats you are now sitting on. Isn't it wonderful, the man next to me murmured. I made no reply. I felt that something must be profoundly wrong somewhere. All of this seemed to be a very roundabout way of picking oranges. The fat man was reaching a climax in his speech. The atmosphere seemed tense. Then with a very dramatic gesture, he reached two of the oranges, plucked them from the branch, and placed them in the basket at his feet. The applause was deafening. I asked, do we start picking now? What in the world do you think we're doing? The man next to me hissed. What do you suppose this tremendous effort has been made for? There's more orange picking talent in this group than in the rest of home county. Thousands of dollars have been spent on the trees you're looking at. I apologized quickly. I, I wasn't being critical, I said. And I'm sure the fat man must be a very good orange picker. But surely the rest of us could try. After all, there are so many oranges that need picking. We've all got a pair of hands, and we could read the manual. When you've been in the business as long as I have, you'll realize that it's not as simple as that, he replied. There isn't time for one thing. We have our work to do, our families to care for, and our homes to look after. We, But I wasn't listening anymore. Light was beginning to break on me. Whatever these people were, they weren't orange pickers. Orange picking was just a form of entertainment for their weekends. I tried, or one, tried one or two more of the groups around the trees. Not all of them had such high academic standards for orange pickers. Some held classes on orange picking. I tried to tell them of the trees I had seen in neglected county, but they seemed to have no interest. We haven't picked the oranges here yet, was their usual reply. The sun was almost setting in my dream, and growing tired of the noise and activity all around me, I got in the car and began to drive back again along the road I had come. Soon, all around me again were the vast and empty orange groves. But there were changes. Some things had happened in my absence. 
Everywhere the ground was littered with fallen, rotting fruit. And as I watched, it seemed that before my eyes, the trees began to rain oranges. Many of them lay rotting on the ground. I felt there was something so strange about it all, and my bewilderment grew as I thought of all the people in home county. Then, booming through the trees, there came a voice which said, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers. And I awakened, for it was only a dream. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Father in heaven, we thank you. Brethren, you're probably wondering what a message. And you probably are watching even on the internet, through the YouTube, Facebook, whatever social media. I believe very strongly that this message has impacted you. You probably was saying, oh no, I do not have to go to church. But I believe very strongly the message of today has given you another perspective to hearing the message of the good gospel. To make you to take away that shield, to say, I do not want to listen to them, for they think they know it all, or that they think that they're more righteous than I am. You've heard it today, no one is any righteous. But the righteousness that we have is that which God Almighty imputed in us. That same righteousness can be imputed in you if only you can submit to God and say, Lord, from what I have heard today, you are not a God that is looking to condemn, but you're a God looking to help those who come to you. And from the message you've heard of the woman caught in the act of adultery, in the message you heard of this of another woman who thought she knows how to come into the well and, and fetch water. But yet at those two instances, they both met the Lord and their lives was never the same. Today you are not listening to this message. It is not by chance. It is because God had ordained it. If you've been battling and questioning the rationale of churches telling you to accept Jesus Christ, today perhaps this message is giving you another reason to know that no one is here to condemn you. God never condemns. And Jesus did not condemn. Neither does the church. And every one of us who today are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have once been like you, but we found Jesus because of his mercy. That mercy is available to you today. If by any reason you feel like wanting to hear more, there is a word for you today. First of all, no one can hear God unless God draws them. No one can be drawn by God unless they have a willing heart and a desire to know this God. If you have that desire, the Lord will meet you at the point of your need. I pray for you this morning as you're listening, let God come into your life and let every of your circumstances be done away with. Father, I pray for many souls that have listened to this message this morning and those who are still arguing and contemplating that these people are just liars. Father, I pray, let your word touch them. Spirit of the living God, minister yourself unto them. And to many who says, ah, I have been touched today. How can I get saved? Father, I want to pray with such people that because you've heard the word of, of life, salvation has come to you today. All you need to do is to say, Lord, I heard your word. I accept the word of salvation. 
I confess that I'm a sinner and I come to you today to save me. Lord God Almighty, I confess that you are Lord and that you are the Savior of the world. And by reason of this, O God Almighty, cleanse me, make me whole, and purify me, and I will be cleaned. If you pray that prayer with me this morning, brethren, I believe very strongly the Word of God has been deposited on the inside of you. And I encourage you to seek out a Bible-believing church, wherever they may be located. Do not look at the people that you see. Look at the Jesus that you're going to meet. He will meet you at the point of your need. I pray that your souls will be saved today. I pray that your way to hell has been turned to the way to heaven. Father, I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.